fluorine. So we have that. I did, I did just uh, put up the, the one from two weeks ago because I'm, uh, I've been behind trying to catch up. I'm working on last week's to finish editing that the next day or two. So I'll get that up. That last week's was just the review we did. So now we're going to be tonight getting into new material. Okay, let's begin with prayer and we'll get into our study. <clears throat> Loving Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us and mercies. A new year has kicked off and so much has happened in one week. My, but our eyes are to you. You have a plan and a purpose for your people. And we can see things moving in a direction that will bring about the end soon. <clears throat> but we have some freedom still. And we thank you. Teach us tonight uh, what we have. If Yvette's coming on, we pray she will soon. Give us strength and courage and energy. We'll miss Deanne and her husband, but we're trusting that they'll be back feeling better the rest of the week. But guide us, Lord, as we now begin this new chapter. There's so much for us to learn, but uh, you will teach us as we can handle it. Thank you for your righteousness, and your, may your spirit be here. And uh, we look forward to what you will give us tonight. We thank you for hearing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay all right so what i think we'll do um with who we have we us four why don't we we just read the whole chapter and then we'll come back and we'll we probably won't get past the first two three verses but um let's take um we're, we're not going to read the whole chapter because we're not going to get to when we get to verse um, 15, we get into the seventh trumpet. We're not going to get there now or the next couple weeks, probably. So we'll just read to verse 14. So, Elena, we'll begin with you. Why don't you, 4, 8, 12. <clears throat> Elena, why don't you, we'll, we'll divide it up by four verses each. Oh, okay. Or three verses. I'm sorry, three verses. Okay. Four verses okay. would put us to 16. We'll do three verses each and then. I'll just read at the end the last two verses. Okay. And there was given to me a reed like a, into a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave it out and measure it not. For it is given into the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months and i will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days cloth in sackcloth okay uh, sarah you want to take the next three okay these two i'm reading from the new living translation these two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. They will have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of, that, of, the, gates of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their, let me say, yeah, dead, okay, not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. 
and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. The same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake slain a man seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. Make quickly. Wow. Okay. Uh, before we jump into verse one, I just want to give a two-minute review with the last verse of 10. Uh, the great disappointment in 1844 was the bitter pill, the bitter experience that God's people had to go through. And John, who was told to eat the book, and it would be sweet in his mouth, bitter in his tummy. He was to in, in basically internalize, um, or the people, it was prophesying that he, they would internalize the, uh, this experience of 1844. And that's where we get the term bittersweet uh, experience. Now, the angel, which was Christ, then told him, you must prophesy again before many nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. So going forward out of the 1844 experience, God's people were to keep studying and praying, and it was revealed to them where their error was, and thus prophesy again. Of course, they didn't know how long. It was just to continue to give the message um, going forward and in the future. Now, we come into chapter 11, and it's a segue right out of 10. Because immediately, and, and it's a, there's a possibility, let me just say this. I know of at least one gentleman, uh, Elena does too, who believes that John got the whole book of Revelation in one vision, all at once, one scene after another. And um, the first time I heard that, I kind of was a little incredulous. I thought, wow, is that the way God just gave it all at once? We don't know. That would be a lot to remember to write down. Obviously, the Holy Spirit would have to bring it back to his mind. It would seem to me he got it in, in segments, but we don't know. But at the end of each chapter, there, some chapters have more of a connection than others. But there were no chapter divisions when John. He just, right. in the Greek, it's just one long string of words. And that's mm -hmm. when, why the translators had a difficult time, because where do we put punctuation? Where do we separate the verses? So it was a challenge. So right after he hears, you must prophesy again, we move right into 10. And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod, saying, rise and measure the temple of God. Now, looking at our, um, we can do this. It doesn't matter to me. I, I've got the lesson on the screen like I usually do. I can put it on the screen. Unless you want to keep looking at our faces, we can if you printed it out, then we can just, if everybody's got it, we don't, we don't have to put it on screen. It's up to you. I might bring it up now and then just to show people who will be looking at the video later where we're at. But um, uh, maybe for the first part, I'll bring it up so we can read. I want to go back and read the, the, um, the Spirit of Prophecy statement in this prayer that I got out of Leslie Harding's book. And then we'll, we'll bring it back and we'll just spend the time going over the, um, going over it on our, our tables or our desks. So this is an important chapter we're embarking on. Uh, to determine its importance, we need to let our prayer be, Father in heaven, we praise thee for the holy word because we wish to understand thy teachings as a revelation of thyself. We pray that the guiding, illuminating, convicting teaching spirit might be here to take the word of the Lord Jesus and make it clear, beautiful, and appealing to our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. And the spirit of prophecy statement that really starts off the book, the chapter, let all who read, let all who would understand the meaning of these things, read the 11th chapter of Revelation. Read verse, every verse, and learn the things that are yet to take place in the cities. Now, I'm going to come back to that. Let me finish the, the statement. Read also the scenes portrayed in the 18th chapter of the same book. I'm not sure why she put them together, except look at the date of the statement. What earthquake. comes to your mind that had just happened a month before? Earth, San Francisco earthquake. 
San Francisco earthquake. So she's got a picture. This is probably very, very uh, right up to the point in her mind. That's why I think she said cities. Learn the things that are yet to take place in the city. We just had a major earthquake that destroyed San, all of San Francisco, I think, a month before this. The reason for the 18th of Revelation, the 18th chapter, is because uh, the 18th chapter will deal with the destruction of Babylon. Just like we, she saw San Francisco destroyed, all the cities of the world. So when I put that, when I was looking at that statement originally, I thought, why did she put cities in there in the 18th of Revelation? And I saw the date, and I think that's probably why. Okay. <clears throat> so we will, let us get into this. I'm going to take this off the screen so we can see one another. Um, the first couple verses, rise, jump, the angel says to John, rise and measure the temple. Now, you see what I've done here. I've got the verse on the left in a column. Then in the middle column, a point, <clears throat> a, the middle column, a point of discussion. And then the historical. We're, what we're going to do tonight, we're just going to look at the historical. With Yvette gone and, and uh, Dan and uh, Eldon gone, I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't thinking we'd get very far. So this will work out better. But we need to look at the historical before we look at the contemporary. We'll probably go over the contemporary in the next couple of weeks. But this chapter 11, it, at least a good portion of it, is dealing with the French Revolution. We probably won't get there tonight because I want to focus on the, this first page, what, verse 1, 2, and 3. So John hears the message after the end of 10. At the end of 10, thou must prophesy again. They just came, or in the time sequence they're coming out of 1844 disappointment and what did they discover what happened in 1844 um, ministry of jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place which means judgment or judgment judgment takes style. place yeah. the investigative judgment begins well look at let's look at verse one does this sound like the language of judgment rise and measure the temple uh, and the, the altar and the worshipers measurement now that word measure that means you're trying to determine something the length of something or the breadth of something it, how about examine examine is another word that could, you could fit in there and examine works better for the word of as a synonym for investigation or investigative by the way typically if you do a study on the word rise in the bible especially when God rises up, that indicates judgment. Uh, or when people in the Bible are called to stand up, that means something significant. And many times it can mean judgment. He's told to measure the temple of God, the altar, and then that worship there. So in the middle com column, point of discussion, rise and measure. Sarah hit it on the head. You can just type in or write in judgment, the beginning of the judgment. Any of that would work. Beginning of the judgment or judgment begins. But we need to take a look at what John is asked to measure. What is he asked to measure? What three things? And the, the altar and the worshiper. Temple, altar, and worshiper. So what do you think? What do you think the temple is? God's church? Is, would it be God's church? People of God. Well, you both hit the answer on the head. That's why I have two lines there. Let me read you this statement out of 7 BC 972. The grand judgment is taking place and has been going on for some time. So we don't know when she actually wrote that. Um, it's some, you know, many years later. And then she says, now the Lord says, measure the temple and the worshipers thereof. Remember when you are walking the streets about your business, God is measuring you. When you are standing, your, attending your household duties, when you engage in conversation, God is measuring you. So, so notice what she's doing. She's bringing it home to the individual. Where, where was that at? This is 972, 7 BC, 7 Bible Commentary. 
Yvette's been waiting to be let in. She had to send me a text because I haven't looked oh. up. <laughs> you, could also, you could also use Zachariah 2, 1 through 2. Zachariah 2, 1 through 2. Sorry, Yvette. Um, we had our nose on our papers, and we weren't. I wasn't looking up to see who was it that you were trying to come in. Oh, she's still trying to connect. Okay. Are you there, Yvette? Yep, I'm here. Sorry about that. I didn't. I hope you weren't waiting too long. I have. No, about. If you me. hadn't sent me the text, <laughs> I may not have looked up for another ten minutes. Because <laughs> we've got. <laughs> we're looking down. Instead of doing the lesson on the screen, we're, we've all printed it out. And we're just filling it out as we go through it. Hopefully you were able to print it out. If okay. not, I can put it back on the screen. I'm sorry. Okay, I have, no, I, the, the one you sent us, I have. I'm printing it out now. Oh, okay, so you've got it. It's just more personal. Yeah. I think when we can look at each other in the face and then we can just write down the answer on the lesson instead of doing it on the screen. So that statement in 7 BC indicates. Was it 7 BC or 9 BC? I thought you said. Seven, seven um, volume of the Bible commentary. 972. 972. Okay. That's and right. And of course, they're taking that from some original source material. So you'd have to look up that statement in seven volume, seven okay. volume to find out where the original source is. Oh, let me give it to you. So over, they did put it here. It's actually a manuscript, MS4, 1888. So you type in MS4, 18, you go to, you probably, well, I don't know. You could go to the 1888 materials, but probably just type in a word or two that is very specific, like God is measuring you. And it, that's the original statement should come up, MS4, manuscript 4, 1888. So she goes on, it's, it's very specific. She says, remember that your words and actions are being photographed in the books of heaven as the face is reproduced by the artist on the polished plate. Here is the work going on, measuring the temple and its worshipers to see who will stand in the last day. Now, Sarah, you mentioned the church. There's a tremendous statement. I'm going to read it to you in a moment. In Testimonies to Minister 17, and 18 and it's about the church god is measuring his church but it's such a tremendous statement i got to read it rise and measure the temple of god the lord has provided his church with capabilities and blessings that they may present to the world an image of his own sufficiency and that his church may be complete in him a continual representation of another even the eternal world of laws that are higher than earthly laws now, here's the part that they have in bold on the, the Revelation book. His church is to be a temple built after the divine similitude. And the angelic architect has brought his golden measuring rod. Wow. From heaven. That every stone may be hewed and squared by the divine measurement. Hewed and squared. Wow. Radiating may be hewed and squared by the divine measurement and polished to shine and polished to shine as an emblem of heaven. Radiating in all directions the bright clear beams of the sun of righteousness. Wow. What a statement. Testimonies of ministers, page 17 and 18. So, Sarah, it's the church. And the worshipers at verse one says, it's individuals. It's both. God is measuring both. Those, are, those who are claiming to know Jesus are the ones he's judging before the world because the world isn't claiming, claiming that. They yes. And uh, I don't want to get ahead, but you brought something up that is going to be in, in verse two that we're going to come back to in a minute. But I want to... I want to finish up on one first. Now, why do you think John mentioned the altar? First of all, what altar? What does the altar stand for? Is that the altar of sacrifice? Or the other, the, the altar of incense? Yeah. Well, both are important. But what is more important? Well, you can't even compare the two. 
for the Christian, they're both important, but where do you spend more time? Which uh, altar? Incense. The altar of incense. Because that's involving what? Your um, pr prayers? Your yes. prayer life. And that's where the Christian needs to spend much of his time in prayer. Morning, throughout the day, Daniel's three times a day. So um, we need to keep that in mind. It could be both, but I think it's it, 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 it's probably the altar of incense. So God is measuring the temple, his church, those worshipers in the temple, but also their religious life. He's measuring their religious life. Um, so we need to uh, keep that in mind. Now, let's go on to verse 2. But the court which is without the temple. Now, you, you notice here on the lesson I've got, the words underlined are the ones we're mainly looking at. The court which is without the temple, leave out. So I was looking at the notes in this book that has all these E.G. White statements. And down at the bottom here, they have the comments of the author of the book or whoever put the book together. It might have been a committee. I don't know. And I was looking at this, this, the comment on this verse that says the court leave out measured not. And while I was looking at that, the thought came right into my mind. And I know the Holy Spirit gave it because it wasn't my thought. It just came right into my mind while I was reading about leave the temple. And it said here, I'll even read you the, the comment. It said, Join, John is to measure none but the worshipers of God, those who have a right to enter within the barrier where the Israelites alone could go. And it struck me. I've been looking for this verse. I don't think even when my wife and I were studying this many years ago under the pastor in San Diego, I don't think it ever hit me. This verse is proof positive that the investigative judgment is only for believers. Yeah, that's true. Well, I should have just called you up and asked you, and you would have told me. <laughs> yeah, but because the other people are judged at the end, you know, they are. But Elena, I've never had, you know, we have the verse there in, in, under the, the fourth church, Church Thyatira. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even though it's a strong verse, and, he's, and he's, he says, um, he's speaking to the, the, the churches, mm -hmm. and, he, and he basically says, I will basically bring judgment on your children, and, all the, and I will examine your reins and your heart. Mm -hmm. That's obviously... He's examining, it's a judgment examination, but it, it's, it doesn't say what this text says. This says, I'm not going to be examining those who are without the court. Yeah. So this is clear evidence that the investigative judgment is only not for believers. Mm -hmm. it's, yes, the, it, it's for, a, you know. The in, lost is for a future people. time. Yeah. Right. So the book you're talking about, is that the Bible commentary? No, that's this book. What's the name of that? Oh, Revelation. Oh, yeah, I used to have it's that all before. It's White comments. They put I it together. I had that book. before my house burnt down. <laughs> no. Yeah. But it's the Ellen White comments on that verse. Yeah. On all okay. the verses in the book of Revelation. Yeah, okay. Or okay. if it, she doesn't comment on a verse, she didn't comment. But on where all the did, verses that she commented. Where did you get that from? Uh, where? You can get it at the ABC. Probably have to order it. I didn't okay. get this at the ABC. Um, it was given to me. Okay. Yeah. But it's it's a definite, uh, it's especially read, studying the book of Revelation. I don't know. They're probably 20 bucks, 25. I don't know what they are. You could get almost everything online at egw.com or yeah. whatever. So yeah. you can go online and just order it. Or even look at it on your computer online. You could Matter of fact, whatever. you can call the guy that we go through the used bookstore in Michigan, and he might have one and send it. Sell it okay, to you. I will... I'll call him. Seven or eight bucks, who knows? Because I, I want more books, like I don't have the selected messages. I don't have the testimony from the, or the church. Oh, I, we, hon, don't we have some extra of those books? Which ones? Selected messages or testimony? I'm not sure I can check. I know he has like a whole room of Mrs. White's books. Mm -hmm. And he only, like two or three dollars. Yeah. Charges. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will uh, try to order. 
to talk to him. Okay. So this was an eye-opening verse for me. I'd just never seen it. It just was, it was clear in my mind. So it goes on, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, when John is writing this, he's looking into the future. I really don't think, and, and Spirit of Prophecy supports this, that the, the prophets did not primarily write for their time. They wrote for the our time. Mm -hmm. Or the first coming, they did do some right. But much of what the Old Testament prophets, they were looking down toward the end of time. Obviously, they had local prophecies that were given, but the majority of the time it was for the end. So this verse, I don't know whether John recognized only it, it we're going to have to ask him when he gets to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It seems like Paul is the only New Testament writer that indicates in Thessalonians when the Christians were getting ready, thinking the Lord was going to come in their generation. Paul wrote them and said, no, no, don't get excited. We're going to see a great falling away first. Mm -hmm. No man of sin, son of perdition. So he was talking about the uh, the dark days, the long, the, what we see right here in this timeline, the 1260 year period. So when John puts this figure in here, whether he knew that or not, or how, you know, we don't know. We don't know if he understood. He may have, he may not have, we don't know. The, the year for day principle that this would be over a thousand year period. And they would tread the holy city, and that would be obviously God's people underfoot. Um, so there we have it. Now, this is what is kind of, um, you might be asking, well, we finished up 10, prophesy again. The first few couple verses of 11, it's judgment, rise, measure the temple. Then, and don't measure the court, Gentiles, it's given to the Gentiles. Because they're going to tread for 42 months. It, does that seem like the sequence is out of order? Shouldn't the 42 months come before the judgment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't know why John put it that way. Maybe that's the way he saw it in a vision. Obviously, the book of Daniel has it the reverse. You've got those four, Daniel 7, the four beasts, Babylon, Mid Persia, Greece, Rome. Then you have the little horn, and then you have the judgment. So it's in sequence. Mm -hmm. um, now, there is one Ellen White statement. I got to read this to you. Because she takes this outer court given to the Gentiles, and she does something really strange with it. So you can go look this one up. It's in volume six of the testimonies, 366 and 367. Let me read this to you. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. Then she says this, and it's like it doesn't even have anything to do with what we're looking at here. The church of God below is one with the church of God above. Believers on the earth and the beings in heaven who have never fallen constitute one church. Every heavenly intelligence is interested in the assemblies of the saints who on earth meet to worship God. In the inner court of heaven, they listen to the testimony of the witnesses for Christ in the outer court on earth. Well, isn't that a twist? And the praise and thanksgiving from the worshipers below is taken up to the heavenly anthem. And praise and rejoicing sound through the heavenly courts because Christ has not died in vain for the fallen sons of Adam. So there she takes the outer court out of this context and she applies it to the worshipers here on earth and the inner court is the one in heaven. I don't think I've ever seen that statement before. Now only a prophet can do that. We can't do that. All right. Oh, if you want the statement, I have been looking for, you know, there's many statements that we think, where did she say that? Later on in this passage, 60, page 366 and 367, she makes the comment, if you ever want it, here it is, that God sends an angel to every human being born. 
Have you ever had any thought, well, maybe it's only those Christian parents that have children he sent an angel to? No, listen, it's to everyone. When the earthborn, this is a few lines down from where we finished. When the earthborn children know it not, they have angels of light as their companions. A silent witness guards every soul that lives. Even bad people. I'm sorry? Even the, the bad people. <laughs> the, bad, the ungodly people. Well, she says every soul that lives. That's pretty conclusive. It's all. Mm -hmm. And then it says the, the silent witness that guards every soul that lives seeks to draw the soul to Christ. As long as there is hope until men resist the Holy Spirit to their eternal ruin. That means the probation clauses. Okay. They are guarded by heavenly intelligences. And they don't realize, yeah. Well. So there's the statement. You can say every human being born in this world has been. Yes, been I mean, yeah. Until yeah. they grieve away the spirit. God is so good. So you can mark that one down. What is that? 60, 366 and 7. 60. 366. 366 and, three. and 367. So it, it it probably starts at the bottom of 366 and goes 67. Mm -hmm. All right. So finishing up two, is there any questions on two? No? Pretty clear? Mm -hmm. So the first two verses of the chapter are dealing with the judgment. Now keep in mind, we're not we're not going over. I, I do think there's a future application. Our last day application is, but we'll look at that in the next couple of weeks. We're mainly going over the historical now. Verse three, <clears throat> and I will give, now the word power, you can leave that off. That's not in the, does the new King James Hunt have the word power? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's not in the original. They added that, translators added that. You don't need it. it it's basically, it's not necessary. And I will give unto my two witnesses. So God is going to give them the ability to prophesy. And here we have another time sequence, timeline, time frame. 1,200, three score days, clothes and sackcloth. By the way, if you just want to make a note on that, I didn't put it down, but <clears throat> five times in the book of Revelation, this time um, duration is given. And it's given in all three different forms, months, year, and days. 42 months that we just saw in verse two, 1260 days. And when we get to uh, chapter 12, it will be time times and a half time, which is similar to what Daniel uses it. So with Daniel two and Revelation five, seven times told, you want that information. So he gives unto his two witnesses and they prophesy for this 1260, time period in sackcloth question who are the two witnesses now keep in mind we're thinking historical is the law and the prophets okay law and the prophets I, there's another word that would fit better but the old and new testament the old and the new testament from the law and the testimony so as we're going to see here in the next couple verses, we're going to get into the time period of the French Revolution. And we're going to find out what happens to these two witnesses. But it's interesting. So you can write down there, two witnesses, Old and New Testament. Now, keep in mind that 1260-year period, they are clothed in sackcloth. What does that mean? Probably they're in mourning. <laughs> I don't know. They were... Uh... Well, I did read this great controversy regarding the French Revolution, and she says that, of course, the Bible was kept from the people for that period of time. It was chained, to, yeah, yeah, chained to the changed to the church. Uh, right now, when you said, Sarah, that you read the great controversy, the, the chapter on the French Revolution, yeah, did you just do that? Yeah, this week. Oh, I've read it before many times, but I read it this morning, yes. So you read the whole chapter this morning? Well, not all of it. <laughs> I was going to say, 
That's like 20 pages. I read, I think I read half okay. this morning. On page two, in the middle of page two, I have a box. And I say, basically, from that, from after verse six on, it's good to go read that chapter. Yeah. So I'm glad you did that. If you can finish up this week reading the other half. I'll do that tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay. So for this 1260 year period, they're in sackcloth. What does that mean they're in sackcloth? Let's look up what sackcloth means. Did we lose? Okay. Okay. Yvette, are you still there? Huh? Does it mean morning? I, well, I think it means something more than just morning. Okay, sorry. Sorry okay. about that, everyone. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Um, right next to the kitchen. This office is right next to the kitchen. So Mary's going to look up what this word sackcloth means. In the symbol book. Well, when they did sackcloth and ashes in the Old Testament, wasn't it because they were in mourning or something horrible happened? And then that's when they went and pray, <laughs> prayed and consulted God and correct. Yeah. It says it says witnessing in obscurity, which was ah. which is GC two sixty seven. So you can write that down. They are witnessing in obscurity. You can write down sackcloth right in the middle column, right there at the end, the bottom. Witnessing they were in witnessing in obscurity, right? In obscurity. Witnessing in obscurity. And if you think about it, you have the Waldenses, the Voudois, yeah. the, the people of the Northern Alps of uh, Italy for mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years, that's what they were doing. Well, they're yeah. witnessing under persecu great persecution. Yes, and they are copying by hand the Bible and sewing under the clothes. Right. And selling goods and then. So that's your obscurity. Yeah. It almost appears to be a false pretense. They would go yeah. into the towns to sell their jewels goods. or whatever, and then they would pull out one of the scrolls, little scroll that they copied, yeah. and give it to one who was they thought maybe they could trust. Yes. But at times they were caught, you know, and they oh, yeah. and they would lie. So it's it's not a surprise that um, this world is getting back to this condition quickly. Yeah. But um, more on that later. Okay. Any question on three? Think we covered three? Yes. Okay. Let's go to four. Now it's interesting in verse four. We have two olive trees and two lamp stands or candlesticks showing up that define who the two witnesses are. Mm -hmm. Now let's put our thinking caps on here. First of all, where would you go in the Bible to look up what olive tree would be for? You want the, the witness? The witness? Zachariah? Zachariah. That's pretty good, Sarah. You just pull that out of the hat. Well, don't ask me which verse, but I know it's the book of Zechariah. <laughs> I think it's chapter, chapter three. Four. Oh, okay. Or it's four. It's four, 11 through 14. 411. Does somebody have those verses? We, we got time. We can go look them up. Let's find out what the purpose of the olive tree there mentioned in Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4. Beginning in verse 2, verse 1 says, the angel talked with me, and he said what? Who would like to read that? Zechariah 4, 2, and 3. What do you see it? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, and a bowl up on the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side and one uh, on the left. The, uh, yeah, the ball and the other on the left side. So it, it says eleven through fourteen. Yeah, you mean? Uh, yeah, that that same chapter, but it right. says eleven through fourteen because that tells what they are. Okay, let's go down, hon. You read eleven through fourteen. Tell us what they are. Then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees and the right of the lampstand and at the and its 
and at its left. And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. So he said, these are two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Wow. These are the two anointed ones. All the New Testament. So the word of God, the Old and New Testament. Um, but let, let's go back to this olive tree business. The, the fact that they are anointed means what? How do you anoint? In Bible times, how did they anoint people with what? With oil. With oil. oil. Olive oil is trees good. produce oil through the olive. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Gethsemane, Jesus, Gethsemane means pressing. He was there, a bunch of olive trees, olive orchard in Gethsemane there. So that was fitting for what they he They say doing. that uh, I heard the comment that the, the oil for the candlestick was taken from the top of the olive tree where the best olives were for that oil. Not all kind of uh, olives, just from the top. Oh, uh, I've never heard that before. Interesting. Yeah, I, I heard just yesterday a, a sermon. Well, now, think about that. That makes sense spiritually. Mm -hmm. The top branches are the ones that are Closer to the sun. Too. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're getting all the rays from the mm -hmm. sun. Yeah. That teaches spiritual lesson. So back to number uh, Revelation 11, 4. These are the two olive trees and two lamps, stands, or candlesticks. They're lamps standing before the God of the earth. So I put down over here two olive trees. Olive trees produce oil. oil. The two lamp stands, what's the function of the lamps? They uh, light the... So they provide the light that the fuel, the oil, given to them makes the light possible. So you have two olive trees, and here we read about it in Zechariah. Mm -hmm. Very clear. Pipes are going. So the oil is going down through the pipes to the lamps. And the reason there's two? The Old and New Testament. Old and New Testament. They're both anointed. So one provides the source of oil, the other provides the light. Yeah. You can write that in your... Uh... I don't know what this says on this because I can't look it up, but it says the lampstand is each person and it says EV 473. Evangelism? The evangelism, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I don't have it, that book in front of me, or, but it says Evangel 473. And, in, and it, then also, too, for the olive trees, it takes to um, Psalms 52, 8, which says, but I am like a green olive tree and the house of God. What was the evangelism statement? Uh, evangelism for, wait, 473. Okay, good. We'll have to look that up. So now let's get the picture. We've got two witnesses. Old and new. Now we have two olive trees and two lamps. And the two olive trees and the two lamps are to define the two witnesses. Really, what the definition it actually is expanding the definition because they're both anointed. One provides the fuel source, and oil is a symbol of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. And did we see it? Did we? We didn't read the verse, but is there a verse in Zechariah four that talks about the Holy Spirit? You all know it. Later, by my not by my, my verse six. Power, but through the Holy Spirit. But by my Spirit, and one provides the light. So you have the fuel, the anointing of the Spirit, and the light. And because it's saying candlesticks, lamps, from the sanctuary. We know that the lamp was... Your word is a lamp into my feet, light into my path. Oh, that, that. Songs. It's yes. Songs. The lamp had a wick. Yeah. And the wick was dipped in the oil, which is the fuel source. And when that lit, wick was lit, it provided light. 
And from the sanctuary, we understand we have come to understand that the the wicks were made from the undergarments of the priests. Now, isn't God marvelous the way the just for review's sake, how he operates the wicks representing the undergarments is is symbolizes our fallen condition. So those wicks represent us in our sinful state. God gives us the power of his spirit, lights us on fire. And while our nature is being consumed, we give off the light of his love to the world. <laughs> yeah, all right. I mean, this is tremendous. Burning up our fallen sinful nature while the Holy Spirit is providing that fuel to lighten. And isn't it, isn't it what Jesus said? You are the light of the world. Matthew 5, uh, is it 16, 17? That's just tremendous. So here we have the sanctuary brought again, brought back into the book of Revelation, chapter 11. All right, we got good time. Let's see if we can make it to verse 6. So these two witnesses, Old and New Testament, providing light to the world, they're anointed by the Spirit. Now this is going to, I don't have to tell you, this is going to take on some personal characteristics when we look at the contemporary aspect but more on that later verse five and if any man will hurt them now this is a really peculiar text mm -hmm. fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoured their enemies if any man will hurt them they must be in this manner killed so elena what does that mean what is that fire what did we learn from chapter nine the fire is purifying Purifying. Fire could purify. Yeah, the sin. Uh, Fire could also mean strong words, I think. Or I believe it's the love of God. Yeah. Hundu, we, you still have the symbol book there? What does it have for fire? It would make sense if the word fire refers to the love of God here. God's love, special testimonies three, God's righteousness. Holy Spirit. So all of the above, love, righteousness, Holy Spirit. Now think about this. If any man goes to hurt them, God uses a very vivid description. Fire is coming out of their mouth and is going to consume their enemies. Well, in Zechariah 2, 5, it says that the Lord says he will put a wall of fire around. Zechariah 2, 5. That's a good verse. <clears throat> Have you ever read the, the, the scripture that says, see, and somebody can help me out because I'm not even sure where it's at. When you give an enemy. Oh, when you're heaping coals of fire. That's where I was head? going, but I was trying to think how to say it. I don't know where that is. <laughs> you overcome evil by good. You heap yeah. coals of fire in the head and thus overcome evil for good. Does anybody know where that's at? I think it's, is it, is it, is Roman? it Romans? Romans 12, 19. Yeah, I think you're right, 1219. Okay. So maybe this could be brought into this verse. They overcome evil with good by giving the love of God, even though their enemies are persecuting them. Uh, I had the sermon yesterday that uh, uh, by Conrad, Conrad uh, Vine, and he said that we are facing persecution and when that will be, we should never, we have to be like Jesus, treating everybody that are persecuting us with love, respect, and uh, nothing that will mar the image of God. We have to act like Jesus did. No curse, no, uh, you know, so. so the the ten thousand dollar question Elena, it is how do you get to that point yeah why do you think we are going through trials that seem to be becoming more severe every year as time goes on every year yeah. <laughs> every week <laughs> every day I know, thank you because we have to get used right with the bigger trial that will be at the end yeah exactly didn't, yeah. you, didn't you just say, too, that the wick has to be consumed? Yeah. 
So that fire has to consume the wick. So that's what the Lord's trying to do is consume our earthliness to shine to the world. Yeah. Wow. And that, that verse I gave you in Romans was correct. But then Paul quotes, that's quoted from Proverbs. So it's Romans 13? Yeah, the Romans, the Romans, no, Romans 12. 19 through 20 it says about the heaping the coals of fire but paul actually takes it from proverbs 25 22 that's just amazing how these new and old testament they work together you got the new testament authors quoting much of the time from the old so tremendous so you know the apostle paul must have been some plagiarist because he didn't tell us where he got it from most of the time. Well, at his time, the Bible was not like we have it, and it was not even divided with verses. True. So they were starting. And neither was the spirit of prophecy quoting in her day that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does that help with the understanding, verse 5, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds. So the love of God goes forth out of their mouth. Yes. And it, it, it devours them. It yes. consumes, not in a literal sense, but it takes the wind out of their sails, the wind of anger. Hostility. Yes. Yes. And if any man will hurt them, he must be in this matter killed. Now, sir, what does that mean? What does it mean he must be killed that way? No, I mean, spiritually... The old man will be killed. I, How do you kill somebody spiritually? Well, what does the text say? You heap coals of fire on their head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That means you, you win him, rather. You win him. The love of God is winsome. Absolutely. So in this manner, they must be killed. They must either die to self, or one day the rock is going to crush them to power. Okay. Let's see if we can finish number six and then we'll just call it a day. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. That uh, power to shut heaven so that it rains not reminds me of the Elijah. Uh, on Mount Carmel. I was just going there. Yeah. Are there are two stories in the Old Testament that are implicated here. You just gave us one, Sarah. Uh, my reference says 1 Kings 17, 1, but I don't know if that's 1 right Kings 17, 1. So that would be rain not? Well, uh, talk, it starts the story of Elijah the Tishbite uh, going well, to Well, you Ahab. can say 1 Kings 17, probably. Well, uh, yeah, First Kings 17 says, there shall not be due nor rain these years except at my word. Now, what about the waters turning to blood? Who is that talking about? Moses. Moses? What did um, Moses do? Yeah, in front of Pharaoh. Uh, the... So in front of Pharaoh, he puts the rod out there over the lake and it turns, or the river, and it turns to blood. Why would, now think about this. Why would God use these two prophets of the Old Testament? in this verse right here. Because um, they are in heaven. <laughs> they are in heaven. Is it, isn't one depicting those who will die before and then those who will just be uh, resurrected? Right. Or translate. Well, <clears throat> what does the text say? These have power to shut heaven. So if Elijah and Moses have power to shut heaven, rain, and or turn the water to blood, and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And like my wife just said, if one represents 144,000, the other who will die, put that all together and make sense out of it, Elena, for us. <laughs> or maybe Yvette. We haven't heard from Yvette. Her, her, she's on mute, so she can talk, but we can't hear her. Um, can't help you there. <laughs> can't help us here. So how would we how would we make sense of this? Well, they're talk. We're still talking about the two witnesses here, aren't they? 
Are we still talking about the two witnesses? The well, it says these have power to shut heaven. The new two witnesses have power to shut stop heaven. it from raining and to turn water into blood Correct. and to uh, strike the earth with plagues. Correct. So the Old New Testament prophecy, or is it talking about the saints at the end of time? Well, we've got to incorporate everything here. They both go to heaven. Mary said one represents one group, one represents the other group. So if one represents the people of God who will live to see Jesus come and the other people of God who will have to be laid to rest and resurrected, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with the righteous dead, the righteous living. The whole of God's people in the last days. God's people. Now here it's the French Revolution we're going up to, leading up to. So I, I, I have to resist the temptation to bring it into our day. We'll do that next week or two. But since we're going into the French Revolution short leading up to it, the word of God during the Reformation age was gaining a lot of steam and power over the nations of Europe. This is 250 years later when the French Revolution, Revolution and the rest of the, the next several verses occurs. But keep in mind, it's not just what happened in the past. There is a future fulfillment. So we may not be able to fully figure this out for the past. But the two witnesses, the word of God, all the new. The word of God is powerful. It's powerful and it's forever. Like a, a sharp sword. you know. And... So even... Two, three hundred years ago, when the word of God was being given by the reformers, yeah. it was having its effect on hearts and minds of people. Yes. yes. Now, rain is a symbol of what? Holy Spirit. Spirit. So if they have power to, let's say one of the reformers are living in the, leading up to the French Revolution, to bring the Holy Spirit to a region or if there's persecution and God's people flee the persecution in that area, there's no rain. If God's people leave, if they persecute you here, go to another city. Yeah. So yeah. that could apply. Turning waters to blood, what's the symbol of water? Water is Holy Spirit, the word of God. Waters. People. 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 Uh -huh. So the metropolitan areas turning to blood, what does that mean? There's going to be sacrifice or persecution. Mm -hmm. Could be bloodshed, literal. Yeah. Could be spiritual or combination of both. So the word of God, those preaching it in each age have power to bring the blessings of heaven or to hold them back and allow the plagues to occur. I think that's what the text is trying to say. Now, this does have a future fulfillment along the same lines, but involving us in the future. I so, mean, it. Did that help a little bit? Yeah. Well, let's call it quits because it's it's almost 10 till. And um, we'll, we'll just have a shorter lesson tonight because the rest of it is dealing with the French Revolution and we'll finish up the lesson next week. And then if we have time, we'll get into a contemporary aspect of, of the chapter. Yvette, we haven't heard hardly anything from you. What is she? Well, her, her lamp just went up brighter and then it down, so I don't know. She's got it on mute. Um, but it was, I learned some things in my study. So we'll look forward to continuing. Oh, let me finish with one statement on spirit prophecy. On this subject of, I didn't get too far. Listen to this statement. This is going back to uh, the holy city show they tread underfoot in two months. Jerusalem is a representation of what the church will be if it refuses to walk in the light that God has given. Jerusalem was favored of God as the depository of sacred trust, but her people perverted the truth and despised all entreaties and warnings. They would not reject, they would not respect his counsels. They, the temple courts were polluted with merchandise and robbery, selfishness and love of mammon, evil and strife were cherished. Man, it sounds like today. Everywhere sought, everyone sought for gain from his quarter. Christ turned from them, saying, 
Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how can I give thee up? How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Wow. That's, if you want to look the reference, it's 8T, page 67, 8T67. And the reason I looked that up, or I read that, because it really fits with what's happening in our world today, and even in the church, every form of wickedness. And the time is coming with probationary time will close on his people sooner than the world. But let's, let's end on a positive note. So here from Acts of the Apostles 586, dealing, going back to verse, um, the court, which is without leave out, leave, the, leave out the temple, measure it not. Christ is spoken of as walking in the midst of the golden lamps and stand. Thus it symbolizes he, his relation to the churches. He is in constant communication with his people. He knows their true state. He observes their order, their piety, their devotion. Although he is high priest and mediator in the sanctuary above, yet he is represented as walking up and down in the midst of his churches on the earth. With untiring wakefulness and unremitting vigilance, he watches to see whether the light of any of his sentinels is burning dim or going out. If the candlesticks were left to mere human care, the flickering flame would languish and die. But he is the true watchman in the Lord's house, the true warden of the temple courts. His continued care and sustaining grace are the source of life and light. So uh, this was Acts of Apostles? Acts of the Apostles, 586. Beautiful statement. Amen. Amen. Okay, we will finish up next week. What the Lord has given to us, I think it was a blessing. A little shorter lesson tonight, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully we'll have a full house next week. And um, Elena, what books are you looking for that you need of Mrs. White's? Oh, yeah. So I can double check because we have some we have some uh, in our book stuff. Mm -hmm. I thought selected messages. Mm -hmm. If you have lost the events, um, and I have. Let's see. I have a, a new idea. Well, she's looking for that. Yeah. Let me uh, let me go over some current events. I wrote some notes down this weekend. Things are happening in our very in our world very quickly. Excuse me. Um. And so I took some scrib notes from a message that we heard on Sabbath or Friday. What we are about to see happen in our country, it's never happened before. The four, three of the four top levels of government, the three of the four branches. So that would be the, the president, the speaker of the house, and the chief justice. They are all Catholic. The Senate majority leader is Jewish, but three of the other four are Catholic. The Catholic Church has taken over the space once occupied by the mainline Protestant churches. You could say it's a it's a papal takeover. Uh, Review and Herald, June 15, 1897, we're told that Roman Catholic principles will be taken over by the state. Are we on the verge of this? Of course, national rule will follow national apostasy. Now, I've been talking with Larry almost on a daily basis because he's got communication with people who are back still in Washington. Mm -hmm. He thinks in March, we're going to see Sunday laws. And he's basing his information off of a German union. You know, the trade unions, mm -hmm. labor unions, a, a group of them are coming to the U.S. to push. Because, you know, they got Sunday laws in Europe, in, in Germany. They're mm -hmm. coming to America to try to get America to take a day. This is going to happen in March. You know what March 6th is the anniversary of? It's 321 A.D., ring a bell, Constantine. But um, Constantine something. It, uh... Constantine was involved with giving the first Sunday law. Yeah. Exactly 1,700 years ago this March. Mm -hmm. They did that in March. It's at 321. He put the Sunday law in place. Now, unless 
you know, God says, no, it's not time. We could see some, some movements. We're going to have supposedly a new president. I and, do. you know, he's going to push for the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. And the Sunday law is in there, in, in the encyclical, the Pope's encyclical. And things are happening quickly. Um, and also how our, um, our speech is being limited, just like prior to 1798, how it was then. Just since last Wednesday. Not even. I mean, over the weekend, there's been changes. But because of what happened in the Capitol on Wednesday, major changes are happening in our country. It's like there is a confederacy from high tech to limit the speech of conservatives on a mass scale. It's a, never seen anything like this. Yeah, we will be followed and uh, monitored for people. I mean, everybody. Watch their... But never like to this degree before in America. And it's liking to go back before 1798 when the Pope was taken captive, censoring communication across the board. Yes, so we, yeah. I mean, this is unprecedented, yeah. which is indicating we're moving quickly to the final crisis. We had a couple more things. Biden, the, the President-elect Biden will need his church to heal the wound. Never have we had a Roman Catholic president since JFK. Yeah. And he was not like Biden. He was a no. man more principled than Biden. Mm -hmm. So we know where this is going. Um, and also the Pope just, he just came out with a, a, a statement on what happened about how those people, we shouldn't stand for any of that going on. They need to be silenced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's weighing in on it too of how he feels we need to handle what happened. So we can see quickly things are moving in the line. Uh, Great Controversy 564, paragraph size five, says Popery calls the Constitution of the United States, liberty of conscience, a most pestilential mm -hmm. error. A pest most to be feared of all others. I mean, if this is not prophecy being fulfilled where we're ready, it's ready to happen. Yeah. All the powers on the left are, I never thought it would come through the left. I always thought it would be the extreme right. But the way things are looking, yeah. Could, the Pope's going to have both sides covered. He's got mm -hmm. Jesuits on both sides. But the rapidity, and Ellen White said, our, the final movement's going to be rapid, and they are. And, and they say that, seen how uh, rapidly things are changing. They are naming him the Pope of America. The Pope of America, the pastor of America. Yeah, pastor. So we could see some trigger events in the very near future. We've seen anarchy this last year, pestilence, calamities, even a financial crisis. Now we have the government bailing out. And if he gets in the office, who knows how big the next stimulus check is going to be. He might give you a, a monthly stimulus check forever. That sounds like communism. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we'll see where this goes, but God's people certainly need to be waking up because the time is running yes. down. Yes. All right. I'm going to shut down the recording.